Hi everyone, welcome to the orientation webinar for the FY 2016 Smart Reentry Second Chance Act grantee pool. Uh, I am Bonnie Sultan. I'm incredibly excited to welcome you to this grant track. I have some fab new speakers on today. I'll give you a brief intro to them and you'll be hearing from them throughout this webinar. We have Deanna Hoskins. She's our policy advisor from the Bureau of Justice Assistance from the U.S. Department of Justice. We have Dr. Randy Chance. She's the Deputy Director of Program Evaluation. She comes from the California Department of Justice. Sharon Owsley, the Deputy Director of Programs, also from California Department of Justice. And again, I'm Bonnie Sultan. I'm the Grantee Technical Assistance Manager for Corrections and Reentry and Smart Reentry. So for the overview for our presentation today, we're going to talk a little bit about introductions. We're going to have an overview of the SCA Smart Reentry Grant Program. We're going to talk a bit about your planning and implementation guide or your P&I guide. You're going to hear from the folks in California about their experience as grantees, and we're going to open it up to question and answers so we can make sure you have all of your needs met today. So for introductions, for Bureau of Justice Assistance, their mission is to provide leadership and services in grant administration and criminal justice policy development to support local, state, and tribal justice strategies to achieve safer communities. And the Second Chance Act has supported over $300 million in reentry investments across the country. Our work here at the National Reentry Resource Center has been authorized by the passage of the Second Chance Act, which took place in April of 2008. It was launched by the Council of State Governments here in October of 2009, and we administer this with partnership of the Bureau of Justice Assistance, U.S. Department of Justice. The NRRC has provided technical assistance to over 600 juvenile and adult reentry grantees since our inception, and we're very well happy to be welcoming you into that cohort of programs. To get you a little acquainted with us at the Justice Center and our work, we are a national nonprofit and nonpartisan membership association of state government officials. We represent all three branches of state government, and we provide practical advice informed by the best evidence possible. And through our technical assistance, we will be connecting you to the NRRC and uh, providing you with all the advice that will help you to form the programs that you have applied for. So a little bit about um, the NRRC technical assistance. Uh, you have been designated a TA lead, which I know you've spoken to everyone um, that's been assigned to you. Uh, they're going to provide you in several different area types to help you with technical assistance. The first uh, certainly is the completion of your P&I guide. They're going to help you to identify measures and strategies to track progress. They're going to help you with content and facilitation reports. And they're also going to help you with sharing some success with stakeholders, the field, and the press. So the way that we like to talk about it at the Justice Center is we are here to help you. We are here to help facilitate your success. Any type of question or need you may have, please be in touch with your TA lead and we'll connect you to the best resources possible. To get you a little bit acquainted with what our activities are for technical assistance, you're going to be working with your TA provider on monthly calls. As I said, I know that you've already had some calls with your TA provider. Um, you're going to have opportunities for expert trainings, for resource sharing, peer-to-peer -peer connections, and websites. We're going to be offering you opportunities to take part in webinars, um, and you'll be having an opportunity to really delve in a little bit deeper about what your needs are with each of your technical assistance providers. Because we also like to say that it's um, you know, not a one-size-fits-all. We're here to really help you where you are and doing what you're doing. And so we're really happy to be working with you to shape this technical experience to be anything you really need it to be to make sure that you can be as successful as you can be in this work. Uh, some examples of technical assistance. We assist with data collection and analysis. We can assist you in facilitating strategic planning sessions or meetings of your reentry task force. Uh, help to provide some trainings on what works to reduce recidivism, promote recovery, and other types of outcomes that you may be looking to achieve. 
We're also helping to translate research into proposed policy and practice, which is especially important in your grant track, as it's very much dedicated to the evaluator and practitioner partnership. And of course, we're very interested in supporting your development of implementation and sustainability plans. We want to make sure that you're successful now and that you're successful in the future. And so those are some examples of the TA that we can help you do throughout your time with us. There is a, a bit of an orientation process that you've already taken part in. The first uh, was on November 9th, where um, BJA uh, did the SCA orientation webinar. You have our work today, where we're working with um, the other grantees and the um, TA providers. You'll see their phone numbers listed. So, to orient you a little bit more about the Smart Reentry Grant Program, I'm very excited to introduce you to Deanna Hoskins, our policy advisor over at uh, BJA. Deanna, I'll hand it to you. All right, thank you, Bonnie. Thank you, Bonnie. Actually, I just kind of want to go over some of the purposes of the Second Chance Act um, Smart Reentry, where the goal of the program is to support jurisdictions, state, local, and tribal to develop and implement those comprehensive collaborative strategies that address the challenges posed by reentry. One of the things we want to focus on when we say collaborative is building those collaborative team of cross partners to bring together to form the actual strategy plan that you're going to have in your area to increase public safety and reduce recidivism for those individuals returning to your communities. Also, making sure we focus on medium to high risk individuals um, for recidivating. BJA Smart Suite. Smart Suite, Smart Reentry actually was the two pronged um, demonstration grant, and it moved into the Smart Suite track in FY 2015. And part of Smart Suite, the programs, is to invest in the development of a practitioner research partnership that uses the data, evidence, and innovation that creates the strategies that, uh, for effective and economic impact. The data-driven approaches enables those jurisdictions to understand the full nature and extent of the crime, challenges they are facing, and to target resources to the highest priority. What we like to call highlighting, when we highlight the practitioner and evaluator partnership, we like to focus on and we call it action research, meaning you have identified a problem and you have created an action that's going to impact that problem. And that approach is able and allows us to enhance the collection and review of the data in which in turn can serve as a strong foundation for outcome evaluation for your program intervention. Again, it helps in building that capacity to develop those research-based strategies and focus on program fidelity to increase chances of success. So part of um, the SMART reentry is actually the planning and implementation phases. So during the planning phase, um, a grantee, you'll be able to access up to $150,000 of your funding, but you must complete and submit a required planning and implementation guide. The P&I guide will guide each grantee in developing your strategic plan that incorporates those evidence-based programs, policies, and practices. And once your P&I guides are submitted, and approved, so I, I want to bring this up too because working with your TA provider and Bonnie's team um, at Council of State Governments, working through to develop that P&I guide will consist of some back and forth till you get it right, and once they sign off on it, we then they then have you submit it to us. So I want to make sure that people know that part of that development of that P&I guide is working closely with your TA provider to get that work done and accomplished at a um, a decent pace, but during that time, you only have access to that $150,000. Once your guide is approved for implementation, you then can move into the utilization of the rest of the funds that are available to you. So some mandatory program components. Having the ability to track unique identifiers for your participants, meaning you are giving your each individual enrolled in your program uh, a unique identifier that says that is them while keeping all of their demographics and information confidential. 
gaining access to recidivism data, having that relationship with your state law enforcement or your local sheriff that is willing to give you that data of who is reoffending in the area you have said you will serve, and being able to report that recidivism data to us particularly returns to incarceration during the period of one year after release. Um, and in your P&I guide, you will define how you're saying what constitutes recidivism in your program and in your state. Definitely mandatory is an engagement of a research partner. This is a research practitioner grant. Engagement of a research partner is a mandatory component. And not only engagement, but utilizing of that research partner that they have a good, they play a unique role within the um, development of your process. And again, providing that baseline recidivism data rate for your population that you're gonna serve. So uses of funds for implementation. Utilizing the current funds, and we're going to briefly go through this, but if you ever have any question about what are the proper use of your funds, you have been signed a program manager, um, and it's normally Zafra Stark or Jennifer Lewis. Find out who your program manager, if you ever are in doubt, definitely contact your program manager just to ask for clarification. Send them an email, they'll shoot you back, shoot one back. But uses of the funds for implementation, definitely targeting the criminogenic needs that affect recidivism, providing sustained case management and planning in the community, comprehensive range of services for the incarcerated population, providing staff training, coaching, um, performance evaluations, or new evidence-based practices adopted, Resources for civil legal aid. A lot of individuals kind of get this part mixed up. The civil legal aid is where you can work with your local legal aid society that works on expungements. They may be helping individuals who you're servicing with past evictions and different things of how to get into housing. But you can partner with those agencies and some funds can be used to support that work. Access to health benefits, enrolling individuals in health care. Developing or use of an existing data system. If your new your system needs enhancing or some kind of way, it can be used, but not all the funds should be used for that. Definitely transitional employment. Um, partnering with someone that if you can provide some type of employment services um, for that population is definitely another, another innovative and creative way of utilization of the funds. And improved contract service provisions and accountability. Some more implementation funds that can, the way funds can be used. Again, um, pharmacology, pharmacological, whatever. <laughs> MAT, Medicaid Assistant Treatment, Drug Services, Cognitive Behavior Interventions, Implementing Transitional Planning Procedures. There are very creative ways, and again, if you don't, if you don't see what you want to do on this list, contact your program manager for clarification. It will definitely, they will definitely respond. So here's kind of a map of Second Chance grantees across the country. As you can see, Second Chance has been impacted and serviced a lot of areas. Um, and we're looking forward to working with you guys in more detail and seeing what you guys come up with. So this round of funding, Smart Reentry Funding, in 2016, there were six grantees. But here's a chart of over the history of how Smart reentry has been invested into jurisdictions to have a great impact and the dollar amount associated with it each year. So for um, FY16 smart reentries, we definitely do three jurisdictions, local, state, and tribal. Um, and you can see who our local jurisdictions were. Our state, the one state that we funded this year is Wisconsin, Department of Justice. And of course, um, always focusing on our tribal um, jurisdiction, Bridges to Home in um, Oklahoma. And I'm going to pass it back to Bonnie. Thank you so much, Deanna. That's really helpful. Um, so I'm happy to be talking to you today a bit more about the P&I guide. So Deanna spoke a little bit about it, but we're going to take a deeper dive into the guide. Uh, but let's first just talk briefly about the purpose of the guide, and then we'll take a look at each section. So the process uh, for the planning phase is to work with your team and stakeholders and to complete the guide in each phases. 
Uh, through working with our grantees, we always say, you know, please be honest and please be upfront with um, the needs that you have, because that's why we're here to help you work through all of those growing pains of planning and implementing a program. Uh, we highly recommend that you uh, fill out the piece of the P&I guide that you're going to be working with your TA provider with. Send it to that person in advance. That way they have some time to review it. Uh, they'll have some comments for you and you'll have a much richer conversation that way. Um, we're going to be discussing these uh, sections and the exercises on those calls. If there's a certain uh, agenda item or, or issue within the guide that you want to make sure is flagged for your TA provider, please let us know. That's what we're here for and that's what we like to help you with. And you're going to continue to update those uh, exercises and parts of the guide through your planning process. So super important to remember that this is a living document. It's something that you're going to keep updating for your reference. Um, and keep updating your TA provider, you know, keep them looped in to, if you've added some new stakeholders, if you're interested in doing some new assessment work, please let them know and, and that way we can uh, move along with you and uh, we can be sure to be ready for um, those exercises on our monthly calls together. So a good question to ask when you're looking at the P&I guide is really how is it used? So you're going to want to make sure that you're looking at it with a couple of these things in mind. You know, there's an identification of the things that you all are doing well. There's also um, some pieces where you'll start to focus on the challenges or the, the areas that you, know, you really want to be working on or strengthening on, maybe what the need was that you got this grant for. Um, you're going to really help us as TA providers target that assistance. Um, we're going to be new to you. Uh, you certainly know your agencies and your partners. This is going to be a great way for us to learn more about you and get more of a feel for what you're looking to implement. So this is a great way to do that. Um, it helps you also to really focus in on what your needs are. We've certainly all been in meetings where everyone thinks that we have a certain understanding of what the need is, but when we come together with something that facilitates that conversation, such as the P&I guide, you really do start to see this drilling down of, uh, of what we need to focus on for, for the program to be successful. There's also some other opportunities uh, to discuss what's happening with your work and the work of other smart reentry grantees. We do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer work. We have one of your peers on the line with us today. Um, so we can connect you to others who are working on similar things. If you're an evaluator, we can absolutely connect you to the other evaluators that are uh, taking a look at similar sets or perhaps have certain evaluation plans that are similar. And we can also enable some best practices to be exchanged. That's something that we love to do here at the Justice Center and we're excited to work on that with you. So to take a look into the P&I guide, there are several sections. Section one is you identify goals and assess the initial TA needs. Section two is developing collaborative strategies and establishing your task force. Section three is talking about your target population, something that Deanna was speaking about a bit earlier. And section four, identifying the evidence-based community services and supports for your target population. In section five, you're gonna start developing your program within your system and your community. Section six is your data collection, performance measurement, and program evaluation. And section seven is your sustainability planning. Again, something that we really try to help you focus with, uh, not just at the end of your work, but during the beginning. We wanna make sure that we're setting you up for success long-term, so that's why you'll see that woven throughout the guide and woven throughout your technical experience here at the Justice Center. We've also developed an appendix within your P&I guide with a lot of supporting resources. Um, so we're happy to uh, walk you through that on a TA call so you can see just some new research, um, some best practices to maybe um, point you in some directions that you didn't know about before. So within section one of the P&I guide for background, we're going to learn from you really the reason that you're seeking the grant, the relationship that you have with other agencies and other grants. For example, do you have other Second Chance Act grants? Have you worked um, with other uh, funding agencies before that we should know about, uh, perhaps partner with. Uh, we want to know what your relationship is with evaluations. Is this something that's new to you? Is this something that you have been doing for many years? We also want to know about your um, current and previous experiences in this work. For section two, 
um, for developing your task force, there's certainly some general task force questions that you'll see, but we're also going to ask you to start identifying the task force and the members and also what their roles are, right? So you want to make sure that we understand who is working with you in what capacity they're working with you so we can start to understand uh, the minds that are really working together to form uh, this grant process. And for three, you're going to be describing your target population. You're also going to be evaluating your screening and assessment processes, something that we'll absolutely be taking deeper dives in together as our technical assistance calls move forward. For section four, you're going to be identifying evidence-based community services and supports for your target population. This consists of some system mapping, which you may or may not have before, um, and also some competence building. So we're going to be talking about training. We're going to be talking about resource sharing. Um, those are the things that very much live within section four of the guide. Section five is going to be developing your program within your system. So here, um, for all the evaluators on the line, I'm sure you're very familiar with logic models. This is one of those moments that we all learned about in you know, third year stats class of how you're going to be mapping out uh, your evaluation plan along with the program component. So it's a really great way for the program folks and the evaluation folks to come together over one document and really see where the data is going to be living. You actually see where the data points are starting to line up and how you can strengthen all of the evidence-based practices that you want to put forward into this logic model. So when we see it at the Justice Center, we understand everyone's thoughts. For Section 6, you're going to be talking to us about the data collection, performance measurement, and the program evaluation. So um, again, you're going to be working evaluation teams, program teams together for the evaluation plan. It's definitely um, it's a joint effort, and we're excited to work with you on that. And then, of course, for seven, sustainability is the connections to the healthcare coverage, other benefits that your population um, may be working with, for example, veterans. Um, you're going to be assessing your sustainability, where you are now, creating a sustainability action plan. Where do you want to go? You're going to be reviewing uh, some potential resources, how you may want to engage additional partners, and then we'll be working with you for next steps for sustainability. So as I said before, a big part of our work here within the Smart Reentry cohort is linking you to your colleagues in the field. Uh, this is an incredible, incredible grant track, and it's been a real honor to be working with the folks who are funded on this, and we're incredibly excited to be working with you as well. So um, an example that we're going to put together for you now is with um, two folks from our California cohort from FY14. They are from the Back on Track program, and I'll give you a small overview of who they are. So we have with us Sharon Owsley. She's the Deputy Director of Programs. She's with the Division of Recidivism Reduction and Reentry. Uh, she's with the California Department of Justice. She serves as the di uh, Director of Programs for the Division of Recidivism and Reentry. She's responsible um, for the execution and implementation of this exact program, which we're going to be talking to you about. Um, it's an innovative and in-custody uh, evidence-based program that's focused on preparing the formerly incarcerated for successful reintegration in the community. We also have with her Dr. Randy Chance. She's the Deputy Director for the Division of Recidivism Reduction and Reentry. She's currently serving in this role um, to be taking a look at the planning, implementation, and completion of Back on Track. It's a Los Angeles program evaluation multi-evaluation partnerships project and the California recidivism report. Um, so what's important to take a look at for this particular grant is they're going to show you the incredible opportunities that come about when you have a relationship between an external researcher and a practitioner. So they'll be talking with you a bit today about their work with the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department as well as the other uh, community organizations that came around this project to make it so successful. Um, just a little bit about it, they are located in the Pitches Correctional Facility in Los Angeles. Um, it talks, they, they talk quite a bit about their um, in-custody program components and if I were to name all of them for you, you would, uh, it would be tomorrow. So to highlight some of them, they do CBT training. They work on career technical education. Um, they also do health services. 
um, educational services. They work with friends outside, so folks have connections to the community and mentors. Um, to take a look at their evaluation, they're doing non-random control group comparisons, pre-post tests for short-term outcomes, and currently they're using the compass and the TABE. They're also using TCUs and are interested in recidivism rates for long-term outcomes. With that, I will hand it over to the California team. Thank you, Bonnie. This is Randy. Um, I think Sharon might be having some technical difficulties on her end, so I will go ahead and get started, and hopefully Sharon will be able to join me uh, when we get to her slides. Uh, first of all, thank you for having us today. Uh, we're so happy to assist, and we're so grateful for the opportunity to, not only today to be a part of this, um, but also to have been part of uh, the group who was, who was funded under this grant. Uh, the funds have been uh, invaluable to us um, as it has really allowed us to um, see to fruition um, a, a very complex program that I think when we all first started, we thought we might have gotten in a little over our heads, um, but, but we're so grateful to you. Um, so I guess with that, we'll go ahead and get started on the next slide. Perfect. So um, this particular graphic, um, I think, provides sort of that overview that Bonnie was just talking about um, of our program. And so uh, one of the first things we do is we identify the population um, that we wanted to work with. Uh, our particular program works with males who are of what we call an, an N3 um, incarceration, which means they're, they're incarcerated for a non-serious, non-violent, non-sexual crime um, at the county jail. And they're between the ages of 18 and 65, serving time for seven to 18 months um, on a sentence. Uh, their security classification was between a one and a seven. That's based on the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department's um, requirement based on the location um, where this program was taking place. Uh, we were looking for individuals who were of a medium to high risk to recidivate, as well as having had no serious medical or psychological needs as based on, again, the location where this program was existing. They didn't have access to um, a full medical or psych um, services. So if they were in need of those services, they have to be housed at another location. Um, we, um, and, and I will say my team here, helped to, to determine the screening and assessments that would be used. Bonnie kind of mentioned those, uh, looking at our TABE scores, our COMPASS scores, using TCU, um, as well to sort of um, provide some baseline information on our participants. Uh, we also relied heavily on case managers as part of this program, so part of our funds did help to fund case managers in and out of custody, which is something not currently utilized outside of our program here um, in the Sheriff's Department in LA. And finally, we, uh, Bonnie mentioned we have multiple tracks. We have four, four um, major tracks within these tracks, as I'm sure you can imagine, there's a lot going on. Uh, the first is the cognitive behavioral training. So one of the things we did was bring in uh, the University of Cincinnati Correctional Institute to help train not only the sheriff's and department staff, but other program staff as well. Uh, once our, our staff, uh, program staff were trained, then of course they were able to deliver um, the CBT training to um, our participants. Uh, we had multiple high school, uh, I'm sorry, multiple college partners, that being um, high school partners, uh, as well as community college partners who could provide the academic as well as the career technical education, uh, life skills, and what we call value added services. Um, that track in particular includes things like parenting. It also helps the individual get ready for re-entry, so it's a little bit of an in-reach at that point. So we've got DMV who comes in and assists. We've got Department of Public Social Services, uh, Department of uh, Child and Family Services, all of those sort of added value, child support services, um, who all come in and assist the participant um, as that person's ready to um, move to the out of custody component. We also have an employment readiness component, which as you can imagine includes things like resume building and, and drafting cover letters and whatnot. Uh, then the, in, the individual does move to an out-of-custody reentry um, component of the program, which includes a reentry plan drafted prior to exit, um, and then they are assigned a probation coach as they have um, exited the in-custody facility, and they work with that individual um, after that. Also, we have a, a program evaluation that's kind of listed at the end here, but um, but we only um, 
but we didn't didn't start our evaluation at the end. It was it was very much um, a part of the very beginning. I think we're ready for the next slide there. So I want to talk a little bit about the evaluation since that's um, the part that I have contributed the most to, um, me and my staff here. So um, for the evaluators on the line, I would say one wonderful thing that worked out nicely for our program is Sharon and our director and I all work for the same office. Um, and I was I had the privilege of being a part of many conversations um, as the program was being planned which allowed me to, to sort of um, guide where I thought data should be collected um, and how it should be, collect, how it should be collected, uh, which I thought was really, really very helpful in our, in our instance. So we had data that was collected as a pre-test and a post-test um, on our participants. We also were able to establish a control group. Um, as Bonnie mentioned, it was a non-random control group. Uh, we did try to do a random control group, but that was not feasible in our situation. So we did um, collect the data that's listed here um, on the screen as a pre and a post test, and we also were able to collect most all this data on a control group as well. And then as the individual is released, we here at, at the Department of Justice um, collect uh, ongoing anyways. We are the state repository for criminal history data, so we're able to um, collect the rearrest and reconviction data. Our state um, recidivism definition is three years, um, so we will be tracking for up to three years there. And I'm not sure if Sharon's on the line, so I'll keep going on to the next slide. So here's a list of our program partners. Uh, this was no small feat, as anybody who knows um, or is familiar with the Los Angeles County in general, uh, you know that some of the, uh, or that the, the, the county uh, incarcerates um, more than some states do. Um, so this was a very um, tall task for us, uh, and again, couldn't have been uh, accomplished without all the partners listed here. Um, each of these individuals came um, willing to the table. I will say, as a researcher, as soon as a participant or as soon as a partner was identified, um, the research staff was able to sit down with the partner and um, assess the type of data that they were already collecting as part of their agency um, need. And our, our goal was to be able to show the, the value that these partners brought without asking them to collect a lot more data, many of these agencies being state agencies or government agencies in some respect, already do a lot of data collection. So we were able to sit down with these, particip or with these partners and uh, determine the type of data that they collect. And we were actually able, I think, in almost all cases, with the exception of the Sheriff's Department, not to collect any additional data, but rather leverage data that they already were collecting within their own agency. So Bonnie, I think we're ready for just the contact information. I know we didn't have much time to, to provide an overview over our program, um, but we did want to make sure that anybody who's a participant on here um, has the ability to contact us with any questions. Um, so the contact information for myself and Sharon is listed here. We also have um, listed Vic Alinde, who is um, our point of contact now at the Sheriff's Department over the Back on Track program. Um, all three of us are happy to answer any questions that anybody might have regarding the program or the evaluation, um, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you so much, Randy. We're actually getting a couple of questions in for you, if you don't mind um, some question and answer. Sure, no problem. Great, and for the folks that um, are still wanting to ask questions, you know, please do use your chat function. We see your questions coming in, um, and we can uh, pass them over to anyone on the line that uh, can answer them for you. So, you know, first thing that we're getting for you, Randy, is uh, what what tips do you have for an external evaluator uh, walking into a grant such as this, where you're going to be evaluating a program that you're not. Um, really a, a participant of, you're not a staff member of, how, how do you walk in as an external evaluator to a program like this? So I think um, two, two words of advice, or I guess um, thoughts there. One, be flexible. Um, as researchers, we really like our data to be clean and neat and orderly, and anybody who's doing applied research knows that's not always true, so be flexible. The evaluation design you see was not my original evaluation design. It wasn't even my second, original, uh, a second uh, evaluation design, so be flexible. 
The second is to have that conversation with your decision makers, both at the institution as well as whoever is helping to design the program, whether that's the point of contact who's reached out to you as the evaluator, um, but be a part of those early on conversations so that you have a really good understanding of the program and that you are um, uh, accessible to those um, program partners uh, in the event that there are changes in your program, um, but really try to stay in contact. Suggest weekly or biweekly meetings. Um, I can't say enough about the, the communication. That, that is so important. Thanks. Um, another great question we got from two folks now is, um, I happen to know that you don't live in Los Angeles, but for the folks that don't know, um, they're asking, you know, for, for someone who doesn't live near the site that they're evaluating, do you have any tips? for um, either going on site, scheduling on site, um, and how, do you, uh, how did you find some success, especially going into um, you know, an LA Sheriff's Department jail facility, uh, how did you find some success in really learning about that facility and the program that they're looking to implement there, especially since you, just, you know, can't drive over there any day, you have to plan those trips. So any, any tips for the folks on the phone? Sure. So, so um, actually, our DOJ staff all sit um, in Sacramento or San Francisco. So, those of you who are familiar with the geography of California know that is not um, not nearby. Um, so, so I will say um, it is imperative as a as from a research perspective. And I'm sure Sharon would have a different perspective from the the program side. But as an evaluator, it was really important that I go out there at the very beginning. Um, I didn't find as much value once the program was up and running, but there was, it was um, of tremendous value for me to be out at the facility, to see the facility. This particular facility is very different. It's um, kind of an open facility um, in that it kind of looks like a camp. It doesn't, it's not um, one giant cement building. It's a bunch of trailers um, out um, on a big spread of land in the northern part of L.A. County. So being there was really important. Face-to-face -face meetings with those who were um, running the program um, at the facility was also really important. Um, I think anybody who does research knows that sometimes research can be met with opposition. Um, so being able to have those face-to-face -face conversations and put people at ease as to what you are truly using the data for, I think that's always a concern. Um, but those conversations being had early on sort of um, trump any of those thoughts. And I think um, it, it allows for smooth um, communication as the program goes on. Okay, great. I think that's really helpful. Those are all of the uh, questions that we've gotten um, from the from the group. Bonnie, so, I see a question that I can't answer um, on the the question and answer part. So if you don't mind, the person has sure, asked, great. do individuals as part of this program only um, do they only go through one track? Um, and so th the answer to that is no. Um, we have the four tracks, but the um, tracks are can be can can be completed simultaneously. So the uh, individual might be working on CBT um, courses, but also maybe is working on their high school diploma um, or something like that. Awesome. Oh, also somebody has asked about how do you determine which inmates are moderate and which are high risk? We use the compass. Um, so the COMPASS risk assessment uh, is a validated risk and needs assessment tool that the LA County Sheriff's Department was already using. Um, and instead of asking them to go through the whole bidding and MOU process that's really very cumbersome in state government, um, we just went ahead with what they had. Um, they were comfortable with it, we were comfortable with it, and we went ahead and used that, um, that assessment to determine those who were medium or high risk um, and therefore screened into the program. Great. Just seeing if there's any other Q&A for you or me. Did anyone else chat you anything, Randy? Uh, no, that's all I see on my end. Okay, great. So, you know, so for the folks that we have on the phone that are our new cohort, you can see um, really what, what we like to do in terms of peer-to-peer -peer work, how we like to connect one of you to another. So if you have any questions later on down the line for the folks in California, happy to do so. And again, I just wanted to thank Randy and her team for the time for putting this together and again being a part of uh, the Smart Reentry cohort. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hear from you and to learn about the work that you're doing in California. So I will conclude uh, our webinar today. 
Um, I wanted to thank everybody again for participating in our webinar and one more time, congratulations on your award. This is an incredible opportunity to change some lives in the community and behind walls and it is our great, great honor to be working with you on this. If there's anything that we can do to make this experience better for you, please contact myself, your TA providers, uh, and you'll find um, some also some information concerning our newsletter up on this final slide. I highly recommend that you sign up for the newsletter. You'll get information regarding events. You'll get to read about programs such as the one in California um, and hear of other training opportunities. It's a great way to get a pulse of what's happening around the country in reentry. And um, we look forward to working with you. Thank you and have a good day.